Howdy folks, <laughs> that was like on point, um, we're back and I will actually turn that off so no one is popping through. Part two of the lifting and lifting presentation and we're just going to take it up from where we left off so if you haven't seen um, the previous slides, that one, um, you can go from there in part one and let's kick it off. I know, play from current slides, sorry. <laughs> so we were up here on this slide, play from current slide. Okay, so address what added the weight first. These can be issues in your social life, issues in your work life, or even just some psychological issues that essentially a PT coach or nutritionist can definitely help with, but they, they really can't fully address these issues the clock suggests the time if you really just cannot make the time to train, make the time to cook right, try to unwind and sleep better, then you have to address what in, is taking up your time. Um, do you need to figure out a way to work less hours? Do you need to figure out a way to get more you time, more me time? Can your spouse, partner... Um, family help mind your kids a bit more and this poor person in the middle again dealing with all those issues and um, that training can help but if they are that pronounced if you have some medical issues that are making you not sleep if you're depressed and um, then you possibly need to go to your GP in conjunction with a P P PT or um, before you see a PT and on the far right we have that lovely Ginger cat and um, seeing himself as a lion in the mirror. It's pretty important too that a lot of this stuff can be managed, definitely not overcome, but managed with a good outlook on life and a pretty useful self image of that you are all you can be and you definitely are enough and you are worth doing this stuff. Okay, so a very important slide to consider um, before undertaking anything major training nutrition wise. So the July effect, um, three great people there um, doing some awesome training down EMF way. I'd just like to talk about this in terms of the January effect seems to be so popular and so fatty that people going to give it holly for four weeks and don't really come back to training then again maybe for another 11 months, which isn't ideal. Um, you're not going to build Rome excuse me, in a day or reach your goals or even reach a goal that you could possibly um, stick with. We talk about losing weight, but what about keeping weight lost for good? Um, Sinead, Georgine and Abby here, they're doing weight training. It doesn't have to be weight training, but they're doing exercise that they enjoy, that is empowering, that's fun. They can feel a benefit from it. They can see a benefit from it and they experience other factors that help them come back, that motivate them, that give them a sense of purpose, belonging, and enjoyment with what they do, and that is pretty important. The July effect of setting a goal and achievement on the far left here, we have John came to me wanting to improve his times for the Cork Half Marathon. He did that, um, and he enjoyed the process. He, we basically built some better shocks on him um, with some weight training, and he was able to run that bit more econ economical, a little bit more efficient, economical. And um, in the middle, Kieran and his girlfriend Rachel both trained with me and Kieran. We even worked in the gym, um, a photo shoot, and Emma had her wedding um, which she was kind enough to invite me to, that they, these people had a goal in mind, a date, a deadline. They got there, they achieved it, they felt fab. It's kind of to get over the idea of, I'll be fit one day, or I want to lose weight, and I don't know how much I want to lose, I don't know how much I want to, when I want to lose it by, and I kind of don't really know how I'm going to do it. So these people, wedding, race, photo shoot, this day, that is in that amount of time, Oh, and how can we break up this to make it um, digestible chunks that I can bite off each day, each hour, each week? Um, and all these people uh, achieved um, their goal, and it was fantastic to, to be a part of it. Weight loss or fat loss are both. So I kind of spoke a little bit about this already. Um, when we measure weight loss, the scales is, is pretty much the only thing 
that measures weight loss. Um, it's a number on a scale. People that only should be concerned about weight loss um, in, in the absolute, you know, dictionary term of the the sentence are weight class athletes, boxers, um, weightlifters, rowers. Their you know livelihood, their sport depends on your weight. Why people get so caught up about it is because I guess a doctor says you need to lose weight. Magazines say you know weight loss. Essentially, our Conor McGregor and the O'Donovan brothers, no one needs to be too worried about weight loss. They are more worried. Are they? Their goals are more tied to fat loss. You want to lose fat off your body to get healthier and to look better. That usually coincides with a drop in scale weight, but not always due to a number of factors, which we won't discuss in this slide. And um, but I just want to give you an idea of how important your measurement is for your goal. So if we think the weighing scales is not really going to measure how we feel, how we look, how our clothes fit, how strong we are in the gym, then how are we going to measure those things? If your goal is to look better, to look good naked, to get a better birthday suit, then numbers such as the scales, such as a tape measurement, such as a dress size, and correlating them with numbers in the gym maybe, getting stronger, lifting more weight, doing more reps, training more frequently. And are we going to gauge your success by smiles, the amount of times you smile per day, right? You control over that, maybe too much or maybe not enough. Compliments, other people complimenting you, that's how you're going to gauge your success. Well, you don't have control over that at all, so that's probably not a good idea. The smile isn't a good idea, but the numbers, you do have control, and they're objective. You put a measuring tape around your navel, and it'll tell you a number. The, the measuring tape doesn't have an agenda. It doesn't want to be mean to you, or it doesn't want to praise you. It'll just tell you the state of the nation at that moment in time. Do it a couple of times in a week. Divide by the number of times you did it you have an idea of what your circumference is of your waist. Change up a few things, do that every week, and you'll see, is that stuff changing? Is it making a change on the goal that are the measurement I have chosen to reflect my goal? All right. All diet works. So this is kind of, a, right, okay, all, all this stuff is great on. What do I eat? What do I eat? Give me a meal plan. Tell me how to do it. Well, all diets work. So like, go on a diet. Pick one and away you go and you'll definitely lose some weight, could even lose some fat, could actually feel a bit better from it initially. The cabbage soup diet, that exists. <laughs> the cookie diet, believe it or not, that exists. And one of my favorites, the blood type diet, holy God, that exists as well. Um, this Dr. Peter DeMano, wherever he came from with this absolute mythology, um, a coach, a uh, very good nutrition researcher, researching coach um, spoke about this blood type diet he said it was similar to going to the petrol station in your car and filling your car up with the fuel based on the color of your car so as we know that would be a bit stupid so eating for your blood type is also completely stupid the paleo diet one in the middle is is quite was quite popular not so much anymore that was basically eating based off your ancestor or ancestors 10,000 years ago so they had no donuts back then they had no Jackie Lennox's no curly whirlies unfortunately for them so all they ate was nuts and berries and seeds and meat and it's it's a great premise it makes you eat less shit it makes you eat lots of protein and lots of veg but and um, these guys usually died in their 30s or 40s and had lots of diseases and it didn't they didn't eat healthy they would have murdered a mcdonald's given the chance they only ate all that stuff because they were being chased by saber tooths and that was it um so that's not a, usually a good base uh, to base any of your nutritional choices on uh, for the long term because some of these the ideas jump 
having more soup soup is, is useful in terms of um, can you can fit a lot of veggies into it but the cabbage soup diet possibly eating that and only that three times a day you're going to lose a lot of water weight a lot of carb out of your muscle and probably some muscle mass and um, the scale will tell you wonderful things but you'll feel terrible and you'll probably put it all back on so that's not ideal and they are essentially a short-term fix for a long-term problem. One of my absolute favorite slides, um, I think I first saw from um, the nut coach, Karen Coughlin, Dr. Karen Coughlin, um, the fad diet transformation before, feeling okay, said so go on the, the fad diet, you lose a couple of pounds, a bit of water weight, um, and then you take your before picture, your after picture, Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt, Got a transformation, happy days, the diet continues to be a success. But then we have the after after. So what happened a month after you finished the diet? Two months, a year. Did you maintain the weight loss? Did you increase the weight loss? Did you put it all back on? More often than not, I see because I see people coming to me dieting for years. They're in front of me because none of it's worked long term. They want a long term solution. Um, and not a short-term fix. So weight loss, accountancy, and habitry, this is basically the crux of dieting. Um, all diets that are successful in terms of burning calories and getting you to take in less calories, any method of training has to adhere to this law, this principle of ensuring that you're taking in less than you're putting out and you will burn you will burn through your body fat stores and um, slowly but surely and um, you take in food in terms of you take in calories in terms of food um, and beverages drinks and you expend calories through a number of ways one being training a small part of it two being just your your makeup as a human being are you bigger you small are you a bit muscly? Are you not a bit muscly? Are you male or female? Um, and then you have your lifestyle, sedentary job, active job, um, and the training as well. There's a thermic effect of food. Certain types of foods will burn a few more calories. Um, and that's really the, the crux of it. Um, your weight, just you know, a 100 kilo male will burn a lot more calories than a 50 kilo female. Like all things being equal or all things not being equal if he was in, sitting his arse all day and if she you know was a runner and he still would probably burn more calories than her just because he is bigger he is twice the size of her essentially um, and your internal organs will burn calories and all this the muscle mass you have all this stuff um, but um, just to think calories out training um, is quite a small piece in that cake so the fat loss hierarchy of importance from myself. So the main, most important thing to determine your ability to lose weight, body, body fat, as we said, is your total weekly calories. So that means, you know, if you have an arse of a Monday and you have a very on point Tuesday, come Wednesday, you're even keel. And it's, it's a nice way to look at it that no one day is going to break you but no one day is going to make you either. And this is people, that's for people who Monday to Friday might be very good with their choices, think they're they're on point and then have a blowout of a weekend. And because they've gone so far over the weekend, treating themselves, rewarding themselves, that they actually balance out their Monday to Friday and maybe even overdo it, that they've taken in more calories over the week. And that actually will initiate are further on weight gain and not weight loss, but they may feel, oh, I really went so good Monday to Friday, oh, this diet doesn't work. No, your all your damage on the weekend is what's killing it. The next block up in the pyramid, the types of food you eat, making better choices. So this is the, this is the, the stuff you just, you know, um, but you just maybe not do often enough that when you go for your lunch, you eat something that is filling, nutritious, um, lower in calories, might have a, a whack of protein, a bit of fiber in it, um, and it's just a healthy food, let's say. Um, you do that more often than not. Um, when you're out, you don't always get drunk. Sometimes you don't drink, you drive. Sometimes you just have one or two. Sometimes you have some Heineken Light. You might have a vodka soda lime. Um, 
and you make these better choices that you know are better when you're out having uh, dinner you get a sauce on the side you ask how it's made is it fried is it baked is it grilled and go for the better option ask is there a lot of calories or a low calorie option and um, you'll restaurants do do that these days and um, daily protein and fiber intake pretty important to get some good wax of protein in if you want to preserve your muscle mass as you're losing fat and fiber as well one keeps you regular keeps the plumbing well going well but also keeps you full don't want to be hungry on a diet the timing the skipping or adding of meals research suggests those who skip breakfast and start including breakfast can eat less calories throughout the day but those who eat breakfast and start skipping breakfast can reduce their calories throughout the day oh my god isn't that mad kind of a bit counterintuitive but those that skip breakfast are usually people who just eat like wrecks and then putting a breakfast into them really sets them up well for the day those that eat breakfast religiously probably eat it not because they're hungry but because it's a habit and then taking out that breakfast could be that four or five hundred calories they need to initiate a, de a deficit boom bob's your uncle fanny's your aunt you're losing some weight and at the top flexibility you need to be able to include nights out weddings social occasions crazy good ireland victories in the six nations that stuff's important that's life that is the reason you're doing all this so you do need to account for them and that's possible with following a framework like this so whoops that's the wrong way so show me the numbers basically to find out what calories you should be taking in to maintain gain or lose and you can get that from a calculator precision nutrition weight loss calculator I've used this in the past it's okay it's only a ballpark it's only an estimate it only gives you somewhere to start and as you gain lose or maintain you can adjust um week after week so there is no way that you could start unlikely you'd start on the calories today and be losing weight tomorrow there's just so many factors at play that it's probably a month, a month of kind of counting calories or doing some portion control guides that you'll really get an idea of what your intake is and how does that affect my weight and where am I going with this? What do I need to do? Take some calories in, add some calories and um, take away calories, all these kind of things. And that's again, that's where I come in usually with people having a kind of a, an objective professional eye looking at all that and making the necessary adjustments but don't get me wrong this stuff is absolutely trial and error for everyone so it's just going through the process of calorie counting is is while it's great it can help you lose weight and get fitter and healthier and um, it's also really educational you learn a hell of a lot about what's in foods and what foods do i eat that are loads load of calories and when do i go on the mad ones and what is in particular that throws me off and knowing that stuff is is just pretty useful life skill to be honest with you and um, and this is what you get from it you get some numbers basically how much weight should how many calories should maintain me how many calories should I eat to lose some weight and then at my new weight and um, because of a smaller person how many calories will maintain that and um, so cool so it just isn't adding up there's a YouTube video here now so I'll click on this and play it and from there then and um, I'll go into the next slide There's people who has a, a slow metabolism. I, I've tried every diet under the sun over the years. Nothing seems to have worked. So I just must conclude that is because of my metabolism. We asked Debbie to have her metabolic rate checked. To me, as a complete non-scientist, I uh, understand it to be the rate at which uh, my body burns calories. Is that right? I think it is. Debbie is put under a ventilation hood 12 hours after her last meal. The researchers can now measure how fast her body burns up calories when it's at rest. And I looked at the data from today's um, experiment. It's almost spot on on, you know, what the predicted what it should be. What it should be. So I haven't got a slow metabolism. So I can't even, can't even blame it on that anymore. No. <sighs> I'm afraid not. <laughs> I'm normal, which is good to hear in one way, but not in another. I carried around this myth all my life that I, I might have something called a slow metabolism. It sounded so romantic, and clearly that's, that's not the case uh, for me uh, and for many uh, large people. Um, it's just not true. We're normal. Debbie agreed to keep a food diary and record all the food she ate over a nine-day period. 
Aha! The first four days with a video camera at the end of each day, and the second five days with a written food diary immediately after each meal. The idea is to find out if Debbie's eating more than the 2,000 calories a day recommended for the average woman of her age and height. But we're also going to spy on Debbie remotely. She's agreed to drink this special water, known as doubly labelled water. It's ingenious as it contains special isotope markers. By analysing her urine every day, scientists can work out not only how many calories Debbie burns, but remarkably, how many calories she has actually eaten. Done. Hello, uh, it's day one. This morning we had massive fruit salad. Every night, Debbie must record on video what she's eaten during the day. This morning, we had fruit salad. On day five, Debbie switches to a written diary. Instead of waiting to the end of the day, she must write down everything she eats immediately after every meal. At the end of the nine days, her food diary, video diary and urine samples are all sent to the Medical Research Council in Cambridge. By examining her urine, it's possible to calculate not only how many calories Debbie's burned in activity, but also how many calories she's actually eaten. In her diaries, Debbie records eating well under 2,000 calories a day. When you did your diary on the video for us, about 1,100 calories. That's how many you've recorded that you've eaten. Yes, okay. But remember that doubly labelled water. It reveals that Debbie, in fact, ate 3,000 calories a day. That's nearly two-thirds of all her calories Debbie either didn't realise she was eating or had forgotten. Now, we then gave Debbie a written diary because research shows this can help us to be more thorough. But the results show she still forgot to record 43% of what she'd eaten. I underreported you. Wow. Wow, that's quite shocking, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Not ideal for poor Debbie. That is the main world. Go away, YouTube. The main reason that people, that calorie counting doesn't work for people, for some people. And it's from one, just not knowing how to track. Don't know, doesn't know my fitness pal exists. Doesn't know my fitness pal can scan your foods. Doesn't know portions. Doesn't understand maybe grams or ounces or what is a 25 gram portion of chicken um, and just doesn't not numbers orientated and can't understand all that and the other half is lies just can't admit it don't want to admit it and don't like being faced with oh right i actually eat like a hound all day every day that's why i'm overweight i'd rather just believe i have a slow metabolism and that diets are stupid and i'm not wrong um, and that's a factor too so while calorie counting is not necessary um because you see there she didn't actually count any calories she made a video recording and a written log so a form of tracking and her dietitian or whoever was with her and um, worked it out for her and the obviously the doubly labeled water um objectively figured it out you know um what would happen and it's it's unfortunate a lot of the times she'd bring that diary to myself and I'd be like Jesus you know you're recording a thousand calories a day and you're not losing weight and you're you're an 80 odd kilo female that makes no sense and when I know it's more than likely under reporting consciously or unconsciously um, sometimes it can be a medical issue low thyroid pcos and um, or other unknown and that's it for a gp and usually when we go through right have they been dieting for a very long time yes and maybe they just have diet fatigue weight loss has stopped have they have they been obese all their life and that maybe they're very sedentary and the calories that i've prescribed just is is too high that maybe a thousand calories was too high for her to lose weight maybe or she hate numbers and all that and she just can't figure it out then go down another route but for a lot of people going through that process what she heard there while it annoyed her and it 
kind of traumatized her excuse me it's so good for her to know she goes oh my god that bucket of fruit salad i was having at lunchtime or at breakfast time was a thousand calories and um, i can't do that and expect to lose weight that or that's not a healthy thing because she probably thought look at all this fruit salad that's healthy so more must mean it's more healthy and as we know healthy is is a very undefined term and um, you could eat healthily at mcdonald's and lose weight and get healthier healthy markers um cholesterol could go down blood pressure could go down your blood lipids could improve all your blood markers could improve if you stay in a deficit uh, even if you're eating let's say questionably healthy food or you could eat all the food she seemed to be eating all healthy and gain a hell of a lot of weight and get very unhealthy so what it comes down to and we'll finish on this point we'll talk about it in a bit more in part three is the questions you need to ask when you're making your choices calories protein fullness taste you can start with these big rocks the rest will fall into place whoops